first one, First Murder, Break of Night. So this is a series of 13 poems about murders that I saw. It's not everyone I ever saw, but uh, um, this was the first one. Uh, and this goes back to uh, when I was a kid. And I talk about this, uh, uh, the hoods in true life. Yes. Uh, well, this is a, the murder poems that you have here. It goes from first to, to 13. And you can read into the number 13 and it's, it's various uh, cultural allusions. But sometimes the murders aren't even mentioned, although they're always in the background, obviously. Mm. And uh, they have some great enjambments and interesting jutting of form. Uh, if you look at line eight in the alleyway commute to all between Stephen and George streets, that's an excellent enjambment because it takes what you think are two people and it morphs it into a street. Yeah. So that's that's a that's an interesting way of doing that. And it ha and the thing is with these enjambments, I can point out here's an excellent enjambment, here's a great enjambment. These are consistent. There's always multi-dimensional ways of looking at these things, as well as within the narrative. If you polish it down to prose, we'll talk about the thirteen murder poems. Uh, I think that perhaps the best would be. Uh, if I can just look here. Four, nine, and 13, I think, are the three greatest. Yes, ninth murder, I would say, is is likely the greatest mm -hmm. uh, because it, it's daring. It seems the simplest, but it's probably the most complex. And uh, it, it has an interesting form in the use of the ballad, and it gets into a despicable character and brings it up to death and talks about ideas even unrelated to the character. Yeah, well, I'll just go quickly through them first. What do you think of these kind of dialogue structure poems, or these ones that have a clear voice intact of them? Uh, and how do you accommodate the enjambment there? I know you have several dialogue poems that are kind of in the Frostian form, but yeah. how do you how do you uh, how do you retain the music in those? Because you still have to retain normal speech. This is one thing that uh, poets often do that I think is excessive when they get into all this airy speech instead of just regular speech. I just have a naturally good ear for enjambment and, and internal rhyme and uh, uh, and uh, uh, alliteration and assonance. And so like the first one is, is kind of a prosaic feeling. It, it sort of, it's, it's got a kind of languor about it. It was a glorious evening. And from behind a garage of cat, it, it's got, it's got the, you know, a kind of, uh, a languor about it. The second murder, summer of 72, I was seven. I can now grab each star from where I stand. So they, these are all, these are, these early, the first three are sort of like my poem, War, or uh, my Brooklyn Queens Border poem, um, and a few of the other ones. I have, I had a series, I, I think towards the end of this, you see I had a minor manuscript uh, that was set about my Ridgewood poems uh, growing up. Third murder. This was at Ray's Bar and Grill. That's not the real. You no, know, the the gap between the first three and the fourth one reminds me of, say, the gap between Fellini's early films and then when he pushes into La Dolce Vita. Yeah. Um, this this one is completely different and far more intellectualized and multivalent than any of the first three, and then it, it leads into the other ones, nine and thirteen, which are also quite great. Uh, and it uses more daring tricks like the epigraphs. Some of the, some of them, uh, I think the third murder, murder might be relatively one of the least, simply because it's uh, recapitulating a, a moment, although it's still in jabbed quite well. I think this this poem was used in Tumbleweeds, if I remember correctly. Well, the third murder is is uh, about when we saw Georgie and I saw uh, a guy killed. Uh, 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 it was cops that actually killed him. Uh, I don't remember if it might have been ac accidentally, but I don't think so. But anyway, um, then the fourth murder, I have the Woody Allen poem, uh, the Woody Allen epigraph, and then Ziggy. And Ziggy is a, a, a real kid that I knew. I don't remember his actual real last name, but it was Germanic. And, and Ziggy becomes a, a great, a, a great symbol. Uh, he's a symbolic child. Uh, uh, he, he's the all-American kid. This young boy, blonde. This one called Ziggy. And then it ends, and just like with the first one, it's the, and remember, and again, getting back to the memory thing, and it is this that I remember uh, about the killing of a drug deal. And then fifth murder, 
This this one was when I saw there was a, behind one of the schools near where I lived, and actually just a, about a block away from where I later worked at the mob front. There's this there was this railroad track, and there was there was from the railroad track down to where the school was. There was this hill. I remember seeing this body one day. Uh, just just rolling down, and so that's why it's called the descent of man. Because when you see a corpse rolling down a hill and you know banging into trees and then going, it it just was. It was just a great way to uh, put that into some some strange mountains televised reverie. And then sixth murder, paraphrase of a past. This is one of those ones where I don't really talk about the murder that much. It's this was something uh, where I saw. Uh, I think I. I think I have a, a longer poem called Compost Journal, which is about the bicentennial year. And it's about uh, when I saw this, uh, uh, when I shat in my pants as a kid and saw and saw uh, uh, a, a dead body. And also an odd thing about, the, the, these, these are the kinds of, these are the things where I have some supernatural poems. I have a poem too about drowning in the lake that I talk about the supernatural. So that, the six murders a bit on the, supernatural side then when i saw a, a woman cur murdered and so here i'm getting i'm i'm saying like seventh murder bitch under the bush so i'm calling a dead woman bitch uh or pres the, the writer is and so it, it's getting it's getting to this it, that's getting more macho and whatnot and then eighth murder terminal villanelle so i do a villanelle and i have and here so my how i have longed to husband you and so here i'm again mixing uh Mixing death and whatnot, and this was the uh, became the rich lady laid his stone ahead. This was Adolf Stern. Rich Headley was uh, actually the name of the guy. I think I called him Ron Headley in uh, in uh, True Life. Um, and and you know you'll notice too these murder poems and some of the other poems that I have. The 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 poems that are in this PDF that William Glass uh, did up. Those are the original poems, and those are the poems in their pristine or their form as they should be. Uh, so when you see, when you see, when you compare the true life, for example, I have a true life poem that call, that's called, uh, uh, I think it's David, no, Donald Blumo in the unicycle poem. The real poem is David Plumo. That was the name of the kid, David Plumo in the unicycle poem. And that's one of my great sonnets. Uh, the reason I, I changed those names though, because of, and while I'll cut this out for this video too, is because of these idiots that would say, well, he wrote a poem and used my real name or something, or he's referencing something that, that I didn't want to be known. So anyway, and then I get the ninth murder, face of evil, or a spick takes on a nigger, you decide who will die. So here I'm really getting in your face. And I'm really saying, you decide who you will die with. Uh, so I, I'm playing sort of like a, like a, a TV uh, game show here, uh, where I have the the character, and I'm having, they both stumble backward and held their guts with smiles, and then as the other fellow, he took his chance. Which should ass die? You decide. So two people who were killing me, supposedly it's killing It's interactive me. art at its best. Yeah. Uh, you decide. So you do you do your dance, a loner than a girl amongst all boys. So what am I saying here? I had already, in the previous poems, I talked about females, and I had bitch under the bush, and then I have love, and then I have uh, a girl alone, a, a girl amongst all boys, and you know, I take I take a speaking of Carl Sagan, the shadows of forgotten ancestors. So here I take something that borderline cliche, but I put it in a totally different thing. And what I'm saying is here, this is a poem that deals with racism, but in a very in a very oblique way. Similarly to the way I have my white cat a midnight at a white castle in Bloomington, Minnesota sonnet, which deals with race by dealing with a white castle and a girl outside, even though the character is never mentioned. Here we have a Hispanic and a black character that are called a spick and a nigger, and they're battling each other, and a white kid, presumably me or most readers perhaps, are going to be looking at it, and there's the human desire to look at these people fighting, and there's always the, the natural desire to say, oh, I like this person, you know, and whatnot. So you're, I'm, put, I'm putting the, the reader to watch this fight going on between these two characters, presumably drug addicts or some arguing about some stupid shit, and you're going to either choose one or the other. But why are you choosing that person? Why is there the need to choose? And what does that have to say about death? And so here I took what really was a, one time just about three three blocks away from where I lived in Glendale at the time at this Atlas Terminal where where the Vincetti Brothers is set, although I think I call Atlas Terminal Apex Yards there. Atlas Terminal was 
uh, the the drug center of 1970s America. More drugs pass through this abandoned uh, uh, industrial yard than anywhere else in the 1970s. And so I, I actually did see this when I was 13 or 14, whatever it might have been. These two guys battling each other. I had no idea what they were actually fighting over. It's probably drugs or something. But I said, okay, this is a good way to portray that. So it, it, it's a way to, to get you interactive and also to question your own your own biases and whatnot. And then we have tenth murder, force of evil. Okay, no more bullshit. This one is real, and I, I'm I'm taking on uh, a New York kind of accent here, um, and it, that's a totally different one. Then Rollo Wax is poetic. This gets back to the character, the real life uh, uh, person that I knew and that's mentioned uh, in True Life. Uh, and this is about about uh, uh, him possibly discovery burial. And uh, hey, stretch. That's the name that I was called by the kids in the gang. Um, uh, and then I have Twelfth Murder, which is a, a prose poem. Time is the lonely predator, but this comes later. There you are, regress to the shadows to watch you watching. There you are, but this comes later. So here I'm again getting outside of the viewer. And then the final one is Thirteenth uh, Murder, profanation of Triska homo homophobia. And besides Ninth Murder, this is this is arguably the best you can. Pause it. Ninth murder or thirteenth murder? Yeah, I also put in fourth I, I, murder. I want to make an aside here. Uh, I was speaking to your wife Jessica off camera in a previous conversation. We were talking about the various poets on verse magnifique, and there's a, a excellent poet, or at least a very good one, named William Glass, who did up this whole compilation. Yeah. He did a poem about a cathedral. Yeah. That is a uh, arguably great poem, or at least near great, but I still posit it as near great because when I look at a poem like this, which is doing some of the techniques that William Glass does in that poem, uh, it's more subtle in connection and it has more intuitive leaps than his. His is an excellent construction, but this one takes off in different directions and pushes it outward for the viewer to understand. Yeah. And it, it has these little asides similar to the Cathedral poem by William Glass that will modify and and better what the longer section of the poem. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember reading this poem at this uh, in Minneapolis at this place called Red Lights and Poetry. And there was this this girl there, this hot chick that I that, that I flirted with a few times and I asked her to read the Angela section of this poem with me, and we did it. And I remember, and I think I wrote about this in True Life. We, I remember when we read it, and it was one of the most really odd moments because these young kids were just so excited about this poem, and this girl uh, who read it, um, and we, it was like being a rock star. And I remember I, I we went upstairs, and I, was, I want, I wanted to like do her upstairs, and and she just let me feel her up. Uh, uh, up her skirt and whatnot, and then after that, she she disappeared. She couldn't. Uh, so there was something about this poem and reading it that I think freaked her out because we had seemingly had a connection, and yet she she backed away from it totally. And then I think she, from what I can tell online, she she moved to New Zealand, married this, married this geeky guy, and goes paraboarding and, and and surfboarding or whatnot. But she got I think she got scared with with how great this poem was. I mean, and I, I mean that literally. It was just it was just bizarre. But uh, uh, as far as William goes, yeah, William, I, I, I the, the thing about William, I, I wonder how much of his creative energy, because he's a deacon at, uh, I think he's a Methodist maybe, um, he's a deacon at his church or what, and I just want, I, I just say to myself, why don't you spend all that time, uh, you know, you can be the deacon at your church, but, you know, go pass out your prayer books or whatnot, but write. Uh, it, it's just, it's just, I don't know why, I don't know what 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 in the Bible is as interesting as my thirteenth murder poem. I well, mean, that's an interesting thing about the Bible is that uh, I would think that if a holy entity would have conceived of it, that it would be the best written book uh, of all time, and with more complex characters, uh, it would be into the future and out into the past. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I respect his choice, but it, it is a, a fraudulent. Uh, uh, silly psychotic impulse that is religion, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not going to go Richard Dawkins on him because that is in itself just as silly and uh, 
not worth my time. He, I'm not going to be his brother's keeper. Yeah. And but I the 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 point I was making though is that his cathedral poem, while an excellent poem, it pales in comparison to something like this, which is using similar techniques. And you would agree with that, I'm assuming. Yeah, I think I think uh, William's a good example. I don't know how much time he gets on his creative side anymore. I know he's he's working on a long poem or something that he says it's it's at about two hundred pages, but he's going to cut it down and then he's going to. I, I don't know if it's on a religious theme. I, I don't remember when I last uh, talked with him. But I mean, yeah, the, the thing that always worries me about that is is the ability to be great is something that you have to work on. And if you don't work up those muscles, they're going to go flat, flabby on you and flaccid and they're not, it's not going to happen. And I, I, I just always, when I encounter someone like a William or anyone, I always try to encourage people uh, to to be their best and it's frustrating when when I care more about their reaching their potential than they do and this has happened many many times with people I've known in person people online people that who, who will argue with me or something about something I'm like I'm I'm on the side of you reaching your potential so if I'm telling you that something isn't working uh, you know it's not because I'm jealous or anything. It's because I want you to be better, and I know better. I've lived longer. If I haven't lived longer, in the rare cases I'm talking to someone older than me, I know better. Because even though you may have lived 60 years and me only 50 years, I can guarantee you I probably lived about 500 equivalent of your years because I'm experiencing things 10 times more efficiently than you are in processing.